Lord, as we come to share this morning, I pray that you just give us understanding, cause us to know what you're saying and how it applies to our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of you will be surprised who can think about how we do church here because we never have the same preacher pre preaching twice in two weeks, do we? Yet I was on last week and I'm on again this week. You know why that can happen? Because I'm the boss. <laughs> and we have a very spiritual lady in the front here. I better behave myself. <laughs> I spoke last week about the Beatitudes. Can you remember if you were here? Yep. Yeah, the Beatitudes. That's good. And uh, I'm going to speak about the Beatitudes again this week, just to let you know that. Uh, so I just want to go through some things which I think are important for us to understand, especially about the law and about the righteousness of God. Okay, so we're going to have a look at that this morning and uh, build it. Uh, from the Beatitudes. In Matthew 5, verse 20, Jesus says this. This is part of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, you know, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you're not going to make it. That's what he's saying. You're not going to make it to the kingdom of heaven. Have you thought about that? So the question, as we discussed last week, and this is a bit of a refresher, and for those who are not here, so you can uh, not be confused, says, how can your righteousness be better than the Pharisees? Um, Paul was a Pharisee, wasn't he? Uh, and he writes this, uh, and I'll read it to you. He says, uh, in Philippians 3, verses 4 to 6, you don't need to turn to it, but if you want to take notes, to make sure I am telling the truth, you can actually do that and check it out in your various versions of the Bible. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am also circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Now this is Paul writing his CV. You know, this is what I've done. This is who I am. And in that, he says, uh, what did he say? Let me just get it again. He said, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He's a Pharisee. And his righteousness is the way of the Pharisees. And he has a 100% record. Got it? And uh, Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if a Pharisee gets 100%, how can you get a greater percent than 100%? So, does that mean we're all stuffed? We're not going to make it because we can't get greater than 100%. Is that what the problem is? You see, he's not talking about the fact that you've got to be better than the Pharisee in the way they do righteousness. It's the fact that the righteousness that Jesus is talking about is not the same as the way the Pharisees operate in righteousness. So we need to look at that and understand what is the difference. And again, if you look at Paul's writing, he will actually tell you something which gives you an understanding. Let's go down in Philippians. He says there in 3 verse 9, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. So there's two different types of righteousness here. One righteousness is what comes from the law. And Jesus said, unless your righteousness is better or greater than the Pharisees, then you will never enter the kingdom. And Paul says, I put that aside, even though I was perfect at doing the law, and I am by faith receiving the righteousness of God. Okay, so that we have two types of righteousness here, one which comes from the law and one which comes from God. Got it so far? That's true, that's what the scripture says. I'm not making it up, am I? It's what the I just read you the scriptures. Here Paul says, I forsake that because I want this righteousness from God. God, two different types of righteousness. So let's have a look at that this morning. 
because it's important. Because if you look at the Beatitudes, which are verse 3 to, I think, about 5 or 6 uh, of the uh, chapter 5 of Matthew, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, you will find that there is a, in that is the understanding of how we receive the righteousness from God. In Romans 1, verses 16 to 7, this is what Paul is saying, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Okay, so I was talking about the righteousness of God, not the righteousness of the law. Okay, the next one let's look at. Romans 3 verses 21 to 22 says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe, for there is no distinction. So it says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God is revealed. So the righteousness of God is not defined by the law. It is apart from the law. But it says the law and the prophets bear testimony to the righteousness of God. Okay, so the law bears testimony to the righteousness of God, but the righteousness of God is apart from the law. That's what the scripture teaches us. So let's have a look and let's unpack this. The question I want to ask you this morning, is God righteous? Is he? Does that mean he follows the law, that he lives according to the law? Now, I, let me explain what the law is. The law is uh, found in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. That In that you will read the law of God. Now, the law of God is made up of 613 laws. That's how many there are. 613 laws are found in that section of the Bible. And that is the law of God. Okay, let me just get back to my notes so I don't tell you something which is not true. Okay. Yeah, move the head or behind. Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, yeah. So it's 613 rules and regulations which are found in the Old Testament. That is the law. So the righteousness of God is not bound by that. It is outside that. Now, is God bound by those 613 rules that he created? The answer is no, because if God is bound by those, then he is not greater than the law. The law is greater than God. He created it. He made it. He is not bound by it. So then, how is God righteous? Everyone said, yes, God is righteous. How do you know he's righteous? You see, the righteousness of God is simply this, that God always does what he says. And secondly, he always conforms to his nature. That's the righteousness of God. And that is confirmed in the law. You see, you can trust God. Why? Because you know that what he says he will do. You can trust God because you know the nature of God if you read the Bible. And you know he will always be consistent to that. He will never be anything else. Okay? And that is the righteousness of God. And that is what we are to have. Got it? That's the righteousness from God, not the righteousness from the law. Now let's go on and explain it. Are you confused? You understand? Wow, that's good. So someone would they please explain it to me? <laughs> okay. So in all this, where does the law fit in? <coughs> See, the Jewish <coughs> teachers believed that the law comes from God. God is eternal, therefore the law is eternal. But the problem is that you realize today over 90% of the law you cannot keep. 
because the law was created for a people in a specific time, a specific place, geographically, culturally, in a specific place, and it was appropriate to them. But when things changed, not all the law could be followed. Let's take one for example. The Bible has something which is called the sin offering. When you sin, you are to go and take an animal, a lamb or a goat, or if you're poor, some doves, and you are to go to the tabernacle and you are to sacrifice that animal for your sins. Got it? That's part of the law. And so you have to do that every time you sin. You bring an animal and you sacrifice it and your sins are forgiven. And you are told clearly you are only to sacrifice on that altar. No other altar. Now that's fine when you're traveling in the desert together. And you're living in this big community and the temple or the tabernacle is in the center of your community. If you sin, you just get an animal and go down to the tabernacle, do the sacrifice, and then your sin is forgiven. When you come into the land and you're now settled and you're spread all over the country and there's only one tabernacle in the whole country. If you sin and you live in the, in the territory of Dan, you are at least about four or five weeks walk away from the tabernacle. So if you sin, you have to take an animal, you have to walk three or four five, you know, weeks down to the tabernacle, you have to sacrifice and get back home. By the time you get back home four weeks later, I'll guarantee you need to go back again. <laughs> now it's not possible to do, is it? So here you have a law that will not work <laughs> once they enter the land. Got it? Now, not only that, you see, the law is, I'll give you some terminology, you want some terminology for those who are uh, really, what do you want to put it, um, uh, let me find it, yeah, who are really intellectual, you want to be intellectual this morning? <coughs> There's two terminologies, one's called uh, apodictic, apodictic, that means that which is unchangeable, and the example of that. 2 plus 2 equals what? Does it ever change? It's always going to be 4. That's apodictic. You cannot change it. And then there's another one which is called, let me find it, casuistic. Doesn't it sound good? Apodictic and cash. It makes me look really knowledgeable, doesn't it? I tell you, I got that from someone else. This is, I didn't make it up. It's real, but I don't know anything about this up till now. And it means the rule-based reasoning. In other, th other words, things change according to the situation. And that's where we get our, our whole understanding of case law in, the, in, in our legal context is because case law is such that it's applied to specific situations. Now, the law is most of it apodictic or casuistic? I want to tell you, most of it's casuistic. casuistic. Now, I'll give you, give you one. It's really interesting. You go into Leviticus chapter 27, verses 1 to 11. It's a, it's a time when the law has been put down of the inheritance of land. Your land goes to your sons, and uh, it's divided amongst the sons, your sons. Your daughters get nothing. Sorry, girls. Daughter's got nothing. But there was one man who had died and he had four daughters, no sons. And uh, they came to Moses and says, this is not fair. So they're saying, we, our father will lose his inheritance because he has no sons. Now, remember, they have not yet gone into the land. They haven't got their inheritance. But their father, who passed away, was not going to get an inheritance in the land which would be part of passed down to his children because he only had daughters and all those with only daughters said, oh, Damien's not here this morning. <laughs> so, this is presented to Moses. And so Moses goes to God and God says, yeah, that's right. So, okay, let's change the law so that we can adjust to the situation. So, is it a predictive or casuistic? It's casuistic. God changed the law to accommodate a situation which the law could not, uh, uh, could not be applied to. Isn't that interesting? So the law is specific, the Old Testament law is specific to 
that particular situation. So the question I want to ask you is, what if the law is apodictic? What cannot be changed? And most people in the church and believers will say, ah, the Ten Commandments, that's not changeable. I'm afraid you're wrong. Now, let me tell you. There was once a, a teacher of the law who was asked, can you recite the whole law standing on one foot? And he said, yes, I can. And so he stood on one foot. I won't be able to do it. And he said this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And that's what he said. Stopped. That's the whole law. That's what Jesus took up later, you remember? When uh, he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he took exactly what the scribe had said, the teacher of the law had said, that you're going to love the Lord. You're going to... Now that in the law is apodictic. That will never change because you apply it to every situation. Do you know why it won't change? Because that actually reflects the very nature of God. That actually reflects who God is. And the righteousness of God is what he, that he stands true to what he says and it will always reflect who he is. Amen? Now, the Ten Commandments, are they, can they ever change? Okay. The Bible, one of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not murder, right? Another one is, thou shalt not commit adultery. What did Jesus say? He said, if you hate someone, it's equivalent to murder. What did he do? He actually changed one of the commandments. And he's applied it so that it becomes different but it is that same commandment. He, he who commits adultery, he who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery. He has already broken the commandment because the commandment has been changed. Got it? It's not the same. And the biggest one, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that it's your day of worship. What day is today? Where are you today? In church on your Sabbath gathering to worship God, and it's not on Sunday. So on Sunday, sorry. Yeah, thank you, my dear. I knew I needed a wife. <laughs> so we don't follow the law. You see, Jesus changed it. Actually, Paul also, also says... It really doesn't matter which day, as long as you select today and you follow. If one person on Saturday, one person on Sunday said you should not point or you, you know discourage, you take what it's about is a day that is set for worshiping God, a day when we take time aside to come and reflect on who God is and to give Him of our lives. That's what it's about. It's not about a particular day. So the Ten Commandments are casuistic, not apodictic. The only ones that don't change is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. You know what the Jews did then? You know, someone comes to Jesus and said, well, who is my neighbor? Wanting to justify himself. Who is my neighbor? You see, you know what the Jews did? Yeah, we agree with that, but then they said that they defined who their neighbor was. You see, their definition of neighbor was, if you were Jewish, only a Jewish person was a neighbor. If you're not Jewish, then you're not... I don't have to worry about you. I don't have to um, love, uh, love thy neighbor as they say. I don't have to love you as myself. You are doesn't matter, because you're not Jewish. Any Jews here? Or any pretentious? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, that's how they live. You know, it was, it's interesting to me. The value that we have is so different to the world. I remember when a, a lot of the Nepalese first started to come into this church, I heard that so many of the parents were amazed 
back home because there were people who were not part of their family or part of their tribe who were reaching out and caring for them and helping them in this country. You see, their concept of who would help and care is only your own family. Who is my neighbour? You see, the Christian content is that everyone, doesn't matter of our ethnicity, our status or anything, we are neighbours to each other and therefore we need to love each one as ourselves. That's the difference, got it? So the Jews redefined that and that's why Jesus came and he started it. And he said there was a certain man and then he goes on and, said, and the third person was who? A Samaritan because no Jew believed a Samaritan was their neighbour because he's not a Jew. And he's the one that cares and looks after and he asks them this question at the end. Which one was neighbour? Now, if you were asked that question, what would you say? Yeah, Samaritan. What did the man say? The man said, the one that helped him. Uh, why did he say that? Why didn't he say the Samaritan? Because he didn't want to say the Samaritan. You understand? Because that was... That's the value. And so, those are the two commandments that will always stay true. Okay, we got all that? Are you following me okay? Am I doing okay? Okay, let's go. Now let's look at the Beatitudes in the light of this because we have an understanding that the righteousness of God is what we have by faith. Not the righteousness of the law. So let's see how this works. And the best way to look at the the Beatitudes and this is to start from the last and work backwards. So in verse, we start from verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. Okay. Who calls them the children of God? You know, I often hear Christians say, bless God, I'm a child of God. Yep, I claim it. As someone said, you blab it and you grab it. Now somehow we profess this that we are children of God, but it's not the believer that is saying they are children of God. Blessed, for they shall be called the children of God. Someone is looking and saying they are a child of God. Someone is looking at that person and seeing something about them and says they are a child of God. To be called that implies that there is something about your life that reflects who God is. Isn't that true? So therefore you are expressing the image of Creator God. God said that He will always conform to His image, to who He is. What He says He will do and He will always conform to His nature. So you come to this part of the scripture here at the end of the Beatitudes, what it is saying is this person now is expressing the nature of God, therefore he is expressing the righteousness of God. He has a different righteousness than the Pharisees has, but let's have a look how he gets there. Don't you think that's good? You don't just start at the end and say, wow, I've got there. You better look at the process of how this one gets here. What is the, the beatitude above that? The one below that, I'll tell you, when you get to that stage, you're going to be persecuted. Just thought I'd let you know that. But the one before that says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay. Who wants to see God? We all do. Are you prepared for what it will do to your life? Let's go and have a look at 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. But we all with unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit. Paul is saying this. <coughs> He's saying that as we see God, then we are changed. Isn't that what he's saying? Now this beatitude, what does it say? Blessed are those who 
pure in heart, for they will what? See God. When you see God, you are changed. What are you changed into? You're changed into the very thing you are seeing. We behold in a mirror the glory of God. And we are then changed into the image of God. You see, you have got to see God before you can ever become someone who people will say they, this person is a child of God or a son or a daughter of God. There is something that we have to experience is that we start to change. Now Paul announces that here, but let's have a little look at some other things that he said which I think are really great. You see, we are to express the image of God. God, and I don't mean you know, that when you see God, he's huge and muscly, he doesn't have this on him, he's you know, one fantastic person. God is not like that, is he? God is love. God is, what else? But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. To be long-suffering, you've got to suffer. Just thought I'd let you know that. It's long-suffering. Gentle. Meek. And then it says, and against such there is no law. These things come from the image of God. This is his nature. Now, can I let you into a secret? It is not the fruits of the Spirit. It is the fruit of of the Spirit. One fruit. So you can't go and say, ah, I'm going to have the fruit love. Or I'm going to have the fruit long, no, I don't want the fruit long suffering. I have the fruit gentleness. Just keep away from that long It is one fruit. You take it all, you can't just have part that you want. Got it? You are to have the fruit of the Spirit. That comes as you see God and you are changed. And then it goes on. <laughs> I can just about do that now. Let's go on. It says, in, in Galatians 5, 16 to 26, where it comes from, it says, Let, Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desi desires is opposite to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposite to the flesh. For those... Who are so for those are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you will not be subject to the law. Got that? If you're led by the Spirit, you're not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious: fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, uh, dissensions, factions, envy drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. That's not an exhaustive list, list is what he says. There's other things like this. I am warning you as I am warning you before. These, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? But, uh, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Two different things. It is those who are led by the Spirit that will operate in the fruit of the Spirit. Now when Jesus was on the earth, what did he say to his disciples? I'm going to leave you. Didn't he say that? John 16, 34 to 14. But he said, I will send you the comforter. And what's he going to do? He's going to lead you into all truth. And that doesn't mean that you're going to know the Bible and you know, everything. That you're not going to have any errors. I'm going to understand everything because he's going to lead me in all truth. The truth that he's talking about is the reality of what is in your life and the expression that is coming out of your life. He will lead you because you are to be led by the Spirit. And those who are led by the Spirit do not fulfill those things which are not part of the kingdom. They, they do those things which are part of the kingdom. 
You say, in the first century world, how do I know whether you're someone who's led by the Spirit? They know by your lifestyle. If you're one who is violent and angry and all these things, and then you say, I'm, a, I'm led by the Spirit. No. Your life tells you you're not because those who are led by the Spirit do not do those things. Isn't that correct? Didn't we just read that? So therefore, our lifestyle tells us whether we are part of the kingdom, whether we are walking in the righteousness of God. That's why they say these are children of God. How do they say it? Because they see the difference in your life. You and I are to be different. I was at the, was it, the bird shop yesterday. I bring birds, if you don't know. Everyone's going to this church when I eventually. And I took some birds into sale and I was buying some other birds. So she wrote down how much uh, I had given her, the amount, and uh, the, uh, the, then how much I had to pay her and subtract it off the two. But she put something in the wrong column, which meant that she put $15 in the, in the wrong column, which meant I didn't have to pay her $30. If I'd keep quiet, then I would have literally been able to say, I got $30 out of that. I told her, I said, you got that in the wrong column, it should be there, you, you know. And she, she, oh, she said, that's right. She said, anyone else, I would have lost the money. But with you, I know that, I forget exactly what she said, but I know I can trust you is what she's saying. Uh, I'm not patting myself on the back, but... She doesn't know I'm a pastor. She doesn't know I'm religious, which I'm not. But she said normally, in that situation, they would have shut up and said nothing. My question is, would have you done that? But you see, we are to be the image of God. We are to be ones that reflect who He is in every situation of our life. Then people will call us, these are the sons of God. Now, they don't do that in our generation, but first century world, that was a common way. These are sons of God. They are different. Got it? So that is the point, is that the second or the second or third to last beatitude is required before you can get to being the sons of God. And then it says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, if you're satisfied with your life, if you say, well, I'm not that much different to everyone else, you know, you know if you look at this person, I'm better than them. You know, that, you know, you can always find someone worse than yourself. Did you know that? To make yourself look better. And just as who you pick. May I suggest if you're going to do that, pick Jesus. You see, if that's your attitude, you're not hungry and thirsty enough to righteousness, are you? You are looking for somewhere where you can be comfortable and just carry your life as it is. That is not a value or an attitude that will get you into the kingdom. Do you know that? You have to hunger and thirst for it. You see, if you hunger and thirst, God will then bring you into being a child of God, where your life is changed. It's not about becoming the most religious and righteous person that everyone says, oh, I don't want to be around them. You know, if, if you become a legalistic, righteous person, that's the worst person to be around, did you know that? You know, when someone is always correct, and always yeah, you don't want to be around that sort of person, do you? But someone who has the attributes that God has, that makes it great to be around. Okay, just do it. You see, between those two is another one. Say, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You know, if you hunger and thirst, thirst for something, it is actually outside your ability to get it. Did you know that? You can't get this righteousness in yourself. The only way you can get it is because of the mercy of God. Because... He initiated the bridge that Nathan talked about. He built it so mercy could flow to you and I so we could come into that position. And that's what it's talking about. Your hunger and thirst for righteousness 
then there is a bridge of mercy, the grace of God that changes our life as we have faith in him to bring us into the situation. Amen? And then if you look at the stuff before that, it starts off, blessed are the poor in spirit, as we know, you have to be poor. You have to recognize your poverty. You have to go on a journey. If you just recognize it and do nothing more, you'll go no further. But you must mourn it. You must be someone who says, I recognize this loss. I need to do something. I need to go on a journey to get through that. And then it's a journey of utter dependence. You got it? So this is the journey. And I know I'm saying something similar to last week, but I'm also enlarging some things because I think we need to understand it. You see, for many Christians today, somehow we think we still have to fulfill the Ten Commandments. I'm not saying we don't do the same thing, but we do not fulfill the Ten Commandments. We are led by the Spirit. And therefore, we operate on a higher level way which is the righteousness of God that we are to reflect his nature in our particular environment the law of the first books of the Bible reflected who God was at a particular geographical location in a particular cultural mindset to a particular people who were living together when that changed the law has to change but the nature of God never changes. But it expresses itself differently in different places. Got it? And so the casuistic law changes, but the epidemic doesn't. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is the core of what we follow. Because in that is the nature of God. And as we allow God to, to give us mercy, as we allow God to move in our lives, as we behold Him, we are changed. And as we are changed, we by faith receive the righteousness of God. It is not the righteousness of the law. It is a far better way than the law. Because it is in your heart. It is done by God. It is internal and it is eternal. That is what the Beatitudes are all about. You see, the Beatitude is not here as a quality and this is the result of it. You can read it that way, but it's not how it is. It is a one person. It's like the fruit of the Spirit. It is one person who has these values. This is what happens as you go on the journey that the Beatitudes are telling us about. You and I are either on this journey or need to go on this journey so that we can become people who are recognized as children of God. Amen? Amen? Shall we pray? Father, we thank you today that your word never fails. That you are the God that has come into our lives so that we can have relationship so that we can change. Lord, without relationship, we have nothing. Because Lord, everything happens because of relationship. Everything flows out of relationship. And Lord, we acknowledge that, that without you, it is impossible. And so today, we just want to say again, Lord, refresh us. Continue to build that relationship in our lives that we be the sons and daughters of God. That we be the people you want us to be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Shall we stand and close this song?